the book that's changed the world. I first went to St Mary's Church in Wickton in Cumbria when I was six. In the choir and Sunday school I heard and read from the King James Version of the Bible and loved it, especially the stories. This Bible was originally published in 1611. It aimed to take the Protestant faith to the English-speaking world, and it did. Hundreds of millions of copies have been printed over the last 400 years. But there were radical, unexpected consequences. You may think that our modern world is founded on secular ideals. But I think that the King James Version not only influenced the English language and its literature more than any other book, it was also the seedbed of Western democracy. The activator of the abolition of the slave trade. The debating dynamite for brutal civil wars in Britain and America. And according to some critics, as great a source for evil as for good. Whatever your view, its impact has been astounding. You may be a Christian, you may be anti-Christian, or of another religion, or none. And you may think this book is monstrous. It's been dismissed and derided, especially recently by atheist fundamentalists. But whoever you are in the English-speaking world, I hope to persuade you to consider that the King James Version has driven the making of that world over the last 400 years, often in most unanticipated ways. The roots of the King James Bible go back over 700 years when English was on the way to extinction. It fought back, chiefly through the Bible. Wake up, it's time to rise and shine. These are all signs of the signs. We have inherited from this Bible a vast granary of English. Its words and rhythms are still on our tongues and in our writings. The King James Bible transported the English language from the dogged dialects of three or four million people in an insignificant island off the mainland of Europe into the prime language of the world. The person you are calling has not answered. In the 13th century, state power in England was expressed in Norman French, while religious power rested on Latin. Both these languages were the preserve of the few. The authorities feared, rightly, that to elevate English, the language of the common people, would be to give a voice to their opinions and their grievances. Language carried ideas, and there were radical ideas in the Bible. Do good to those who hate you. Love thy neighbor as thyself. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. From the Middle Ages onwards, radical Christian priests had found that ideas of liberty and equality could be dug out of its verses. But for most people, such ideas remained hidden in a Latin Bible they couldn't understand, until one man set out to translate the scriptures into memorable English. In the 1520s, it was William Tyndall, whose genius, I believe, unleashed the power of the English Bible. It was his poetic force which lit the fuse for reforms and revolutions which would roar and sing through the English-speaking world for four centuries. 
was his unique talent for translation, which drew from original Greek, Hebrew, Syriac and Latin sources spliced with Anglo-Saxon. His version was the foundation of the King James Bible. Tyndall was persecuted for this illegal and majestic enterprise. He fled the country when he was 30 to continue his endeavor from exile in Europe. For this, he would be strangled and burned at the stake. Sympathizers shipped his New Testament and then much of the Old Testament into an embattled English kingdom. The Bishop of London bought up all the available copies and burned them on the steps of the old St. Paul's. Today, one of the few surviving original editions of Tyndall is held in the cathedral's library. Three climactic events served Tyndall well. The first was the Reformation in Germany in 1517 led by Martin Luther. It was an emotional and intellectual earthquake throughout Europe. It undermined the seemingly all-powerful Roman Catholic Church and it demanded that everyone should have the right to read the Bible in their own language. The second was that through the invention of printing, tens of thousands, and as it later proved, tens of millions, could be published with ease and cheaply. The third factor was Henry VIII's cynical embrace of the Protestant Reformation so that he could divorce his first wife and marry another. It led to a political decision to make a new translation in English borrowing heavily from Tyndall. Tyndall wanted to translate the Bible into the language understood by peasants. He often said the ploughboy was his chosen listener. He had an ear for the beauty of words. His phrasing was compelling and memorable. He created timeless and enduring turns of phrase. Fight the good fight, found in 1 Timothy here. From Matthew, salt of the earth. And there are so many more. Fell flat in his face, a man after his own heart, under the sun, sour grapes, pride goes before a fall, and it came to pass, and literally thousands of others. The is, there are more unto themselves. I don't want to be made a scapegoat. The spirit, the spirit is, is weak, willing, but the, but the flesh, flesh is, is weak. weak. Tyndall's genius for a phrase, his clarity, have penetrated deep into the bedrock of English today, wherever it's spoken. And his words have provided, I think, a still the most radical agenda ever delivered. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It also infused the heart of English literature. Shakespeare, for example, as a regular churchgoer here at Holy Trinity in Stratford in the late 16th century, would have heard readings from another English Bible, also heavily indebted to Tyndall. The Geneva Bible. This is it. It was translated into English by radical Protestant refugees in Switzerland, but it relied in its New Testament on Tyndall. 85% of Matthew and 92% of the book of Revelation are from Tyndall. It's much the same in the King James Bible. So, Shakespeare, in listening to the Geneva Bible, was in fact hearing most of what would become the King James Bible. It's easier to hear this language reflected in Shakespeare's plays. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. There's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, it is not to come. If it be not to come. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which I have man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen, man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceal. With what judgments ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Death for death, haste still pays haste, and leisure answers leisure. Like doth quit like, and measure still for measure. 
and there were the stories as well as the language. In Shakespeare, there are definite allusions to 42 books in the Bible. The story of Goliath is referred to three times. Peter, the whore of Babylon, and Lazarus all appear seven times. Samson, Solomon, and the prodigal son, nine times. Judas, 23. Cain and Job, 25 times. The biblical scholar Stephen Greenblatt wrote that without Tyndall's New Testament and Cranmer's prayer book, it's difficult to imagine William Shakespeare the playwright. The King James Version wasn't the first of the several Bibles translated into English, but it was and remains far and away the most influential. The Bible after 1611 was a river which carried literature in its flow for centuries. Where Shakespeare trod, the world of writers flocked to follow. Huge debts are owed and paid in full by Shelley, Wordsworth, Milton, Blake, Dryden, Daniel Defoe, and by John Donne, John Bunyan, D. H. Lawrence, the Brontes, and George Eliot. And in the poems of T.S. Eliot, from the story of the wise man in his The Coming of the Magi to the account of a churchyard in Little Gidding and his reflections on his conversion to Anglicanism in Ash Wednesday, Eliot's work is suffused with the Bible, its stories and its message. This is from Choruses from the Rock. In the beginning, God created the world, waste and void, waste and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep. It's straight from the opening book of the Bible, Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In America, it was the same story. From 19th century bestseller Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter, which deals with the themes of sin and guilt, to Harriet Beecher Stowe's nation-changing anti-slavery novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And later, Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath and Toni Morrison's Beloved. The King James Version of 1611 was, over 400 years, to make the Bible part of the English speaker's DNA. For centuries it has told us what we were. It stabilized the language and the faith and the sense of itself of this country. And its impact extended far beyond language. From its vast, often puzzling vaults, ideals have been quarried which have proved radical right across society. From democracy to philanthropy, and even science. But 400 years ago, the original purpose of the Bible was different. For its commissioner, James I, the Bible was about political survival. James was born here in Edinburgh Castle and within a year he was declared James VI of Scotland. So he was cradled in kingship and he was force fed religion. By eight it was said of him that he could open the Bible at any page and translate any verse from Latin into French and from French into English. Religion at that time wasn't only faith, it was the medium of politics. Life in Scotland was life in a religious laboratory. All human life and all thought had to be percolated through the Bible. Scottish religion in particular was largely straight out of the Protestant Reformation. Known as Presbyterianism, 
It was an irascible brand of Protestantism, often showing more respect to its congregations than to its monarch.